shamanism. This is Jack Donovan, and you're listening to or watching a special edition of Pater, PH2T3R, a journal for solar culture. And today we have a really interesting episode. We're going to talk about shamanism. And uh, we have a guest. And, you know, before I say this, I I, I always joke that in American English, when someone says that they're studying shamanism, um, I'm assuming that they went to Burning Man and they're taking drugs. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a shaman, a shaman in American English is, means, uh, you know, upper middle class drug dealer. But as I was talking to this guy uh, who is named John Smith, and we'll get to that later. Uh, but uh, as I talked to John, uh, he, he's like, oh, well, no, I'm in Russia and I'm studying shamanism in Russia. I'm like, oh, well, that is a very different thing entirely. Uh, and so, it, you know, it should be a really interesting conversation. And uh, we'll find out what 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 shamanism means to him. My my reference for shamanism is uh, this book by Mercy Eliada, uh, which I read many years ago. That was kind of my only frame for it. And that's why I always kind of laughed when people were like, I'm a, I'm a shaman, man. Uh, you know, because he's, you know, this is very technical uh, stuff that he studied. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, let's get started. All right. So John, uh, tell me a little bit about your background because you have a long and winding path. We had a talk beforehand uh, you have a long and winding path that takes you to where you are now, which is obviously a very interesting place. But tell me a little bit about uh, you know how, how you got there. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jack. Uh, it's been a pleasure really uh, talking with you and, and really being able to kind of voice uh, not only this journey, but uh, why people like me get on this journey. Mm-hmm. And uh, the background that I come from is not what people typically associate with shamanism sometimes. And when you see me on the camera, uh, you say shaman, it's, uh, I don't look like your typical shaman. And so I'll, I actually get around to that as well as get around to the neo-shamanism and um, you know why, why that word is so widely spread and used. So a little bit about me, I'm originally from the United States, which uh, the fact that I sit in Russia right now is uh, a whole podcast by itself. But um, I was uh, joined the military when I was 17. I grew up in the mountains of Tennessee and in Texas and uh, joined the military and went straight into special operations and uh, spent about eight years there with uh, 10 special forces. And then I got out of that and went into law enforcement in about 12 years there in Florida and Tennessee as well. And then answered the call post 9-11 to get my contractor on and jumped on with some companies like Blackwater and went and served. Um, I have about a thousand days on the ground in Afghanistan. I eventually became a special agent for the CIA and uh, spent 10 years doing that. Um, and then I have this long journey of how I came to Russia. And that's a big question in itself, except that it's actually pretty simple. I started a, a quest for knowledge many, many years ago. I uh, came from a Christian background, like a lot of people do in the United States, and just kind of progressed through uh, a search, I think, I guess, for myself, search for meaning, belonging. And uh, lived in Africa, I've lived in Uganda, I've worked all over East Africa, Congo, uh, South Sudan, you name it. Uh, I've lived in Thailand, working on anti-human trafficking uh, work there. I lived in Ireland, and Ireland was a big time, and Norway spent uh, doing that typical quest that we do from Celtic and Germanic and um, all that background. We're looking for that same belonging. And then when I was leaving Thailand, uh, myself and my family were still in that search. And... Um, I'd always wanted to come see Russia and there was a friend of ours having a wedding and it uh, with my work since I, I left the agency, I've helped people travel. I started executive protection work and all over the world, uh, security advising, that sort of thing. The guys like me, they get into that when they uh, quit their government career. And there were some anthropologists and some, uh, you know, some researchers coming to Siberia um, to do some research on some bones and things they found there that are connecting Siberians to Native Americans. And so I tied a work trip in with a family trip, came to Russia, and uh, in Siberia just got exposed to uh, shamans. And um, I found Russia to be a a very spiritual place. They're into a lot of spirituality here, which was encouraging uh, to see, and remained. And I got into studying shamanism and kind of found something real in that, uh, that intrigued me and drew me. And here I am. So 
Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's obviously an interesting pathway uh, to get there. So I guess a, a starting question might be, what does, what does being a shaman actually mean in your yeah. yeah. So I think everybody, if they don't have one, should have a, a why. And so uh, shamanism to me um, took me back to a place. I think we all long for that, uh, that kind of tribal uh, it's very closely connected to animism and actually, my my hope in, in talking with you today and whoever listens to this is, um, I hope at the end of it, I have made you more of a shaman than a lot of the people selling that today. And that's because it's very, very complex. Uh, animism isn't something that was um, going to evolve. Animism is not evolving. Animism is animism even today. It is very closely connected to shamanism. And so when you're looking for something, a routine or ritual, and, you know, and I've, I've done a search through world religions, as I mentioned, and there are a lot of routines and things that people do. They're praying so many times a day and all these things that make you feel more connected. And so the thing about shamanism that makes you feel more connected is that anybody can really do it. Uh, you can get to a certain point where it gets very technical and you can get to a certain point where you need certain attributes and things to wear and do things like this. But at its root is animism. And so it gave me something that I could connect to instantly. Mm. Um, if you love nature as I do, uh, you love getting out in the wild and uh, you sit and you talk with these shamans and you find out, I ask a shaman, actually there's a, there's a shaman, I recently returned from Siberia and I was on an island there called Okan Island. And it's one of the high marks of shamanism in the world and definitely in Siberia, it's one of the highest places of power, they call it. And there's several places of power in Russia. <clears throat> and I went there and a very famous, I didn't know he was famous at the time, a man came, I, we lived in a yurt, my family and I, or they call it a gur, Mongolian gur. We lived in that on the island and uh, this man came to visit our house and he'd heard that we were on the island and I was going around asking questions and trying to learn things. Didn't know who he was until after, but he came in and uh, I asked him at one point after I realized he was a shaman, I said, well, who teaches you? I would like, you know, I'm looking for teachers in Siberia, legitimate uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. And he said, my ancestor taught me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, OK, well, that means his grandmother or his grandpa. Like it comes on to find that his ancestors still teach him from generations back. And I understood that, you know, growing up in uh, the United States and I have some Cherokee enemy like a lot of people do from the southeast United States. And. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I understood a little bit of that that medicine man uh, type mentality and that talk of ancestors and, and spirits and things of that nature. So um, it became something that, you know, you can do and uh, you can do it very easily. And so I quickly began to adapt some of these lifestyles uh, or some of these uh, techniques that you can do to connect with nature and instantly started seeing, you know, I guess, results. And and even in his in his visit, he uh, says some things about my wife and my daughter that, uh, you know, is no way he could have known, you know, aside from, you know, the spirits, I guess you would say. So I think it really comes down to um, how you how you want to open your mind. And for me, you know, the, when you typically think of a shaman, you think of somebody that looks different than me or. You think of a person casting spells out sword fighting in the park with some LARPers or something like that. And, <laughs> um, you know, not to knock those guys, it's, 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 it's good to enjoy and to, to watch. But, you know, I come from a special operations background and I find that a lot of guys like me have a really big open mind. They want to know things, they ask questions. Mm -hmm. and so it sets them a little bit, a little bit apart from just the followers of do this, do that. Uh, guys in spec ops, they, they like to ask questions, the why. And mm -hmm. so, um, when you can open your mind up to maybe there's a bigger picture, maybe there's something uh, more that I can do. Mm -hmm. And I think my world travels help with that, uh, living in Africa and all these places. So, uh, yeah, shamanism just kind of spoke to us. And uh, once you get started in it, uh, it's like a lot of things. You you just go all the way. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned shamanism and, and animism. and. Mm -hmm. And the fact that at the end of this, I would like to say that I've made you closer to being a shaman than um, you were before. And the neo-shamanism is, is really big out there. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are trying to 
be special and find something that they belong to. And I'm not going to knock that. Right. You know, I, I don't not, I don't like it when, you know, some of the neo whatevers are trying to recreate something. And there's a, a lady I listen to. Her name is uh, Annette Host up in Denmark. And she studies the cider, the, the Norse right. um, version of shamanism. And she had a quote that uh, she said, and I still use this uh, quote today. And that is, uh, tradition is not about uh, worshiping the ashes, but it's about keeping the fire alive today. Right. And so uh, a lot of the things with the neo-shamanism and everybody calling themselves shamans all around the world. You know, the word shaman itself comes from Siberia. It means shaman. Right. Or shaman is the word. And it means the one who knows, simply the one who knows. And so uh, people who uh, know a lot of things, you know, and then apply that to a spiritual nature in a sense, uh, are doing some sort of uh, shamanic activity. And it just, uh, it seems that um, if you can open your mind to the fact that the world is possibly bigger and, you know, uh, then you grew up being, you know, if you grew up in America, your probably ancestry is a thousand years of Christianity, you know, yeah. or longer. Yeah. And so um, the main core principles of shamanism, animism is uh, the worship or the acknowledgement of spirits in nature or your traditional animist. Right. A shaman is somebody who works between those worlds, both the physical world and the animist and spirit world mm -hmm. and your ancestors. Right. And so, I would hazard to say that especially we struggle with that in America because we've forgotten our ancestors and it gets complicated when your ancestors are maybe two or three generations back, they jump over to Europe somewhere. Okay. And, you know, an ancestry.com has allowed us to maybe identify some of that ancestry. You know, you can do ancestry.com and find out your 50% Scottish and all these type of things and helps you, come up with birth certificates. And so in shamanism, one accepting that everything has energy, everything has possibly spirit and that you can learn to work with those mm -hmm. principles and acknowledge your ancestors. Right. And so it can be very, very complicated and somebody can sell you a, you know, a year long course on how to become a shaman online. Yeah. Um, but you can go do it tomorrow. And that's why it's I when you started doing a uh, order of the fire, and I'd, I'd like to ask you here in a minute or whenever you're ready to answer why you pick fire mm -hmm. um, as the order of fire, because in all of these cultures since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. there's big connections. When I studied world religions and lived some of them myself, I found that these connections, there's lots of connections with water, there's lots of connections with fire. And fire is one of the most important elements in shamanism and animism. So you, you may already know that is maybe there's some reason why you chose fire, but uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, well, I basically chose fire as obviously anyone who's read Fire in the Dark. Um, I mean, this is fire is a thing that we have in common. Mm -hmm. uh, all men, the idea of men gathered around a fire having a conversation is very, 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 very old. <laughs> yeah. you know? And it's everywhere. And it, it's everywhere. There was every continent on Earth that happened. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's a common experience that we all share, and it's something that we all, you know, the millions and millions of hours. And this is something I talked to about in ritual. Actually, is uh, we kind of try to collapse time. Right. Is one of the processes that I, I talk through in, in kind of my experience with doing these kinds of things. Uh, the idea of a an eternal fire, a, a mythic fire. You you want to have it at mythic time. And uh, you know, fire is something that's been part of rituals uh, since before there were words. <laughs> yeah. You know, like uh, it, it goes back. So it's easy, I think, for people to imagine that because they know that it's true. You know, like whether you're settling the American West, there's dudes driving, riding across on on horses, uh, and they're stopping and having campfires every night. Right. Or whether you're, you know, in uh, Europe two thousand years ago. This is happening over and over again. So it's easy to talk to a whole bunch of guys and say, say, imagine all of the men forever <laughs> that have been around a fire and doing this thing. Uh, it's a very centralizing idea. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I knew I knew that. Yeah. Uh, but I thought uh, somebody 
listen to me talk about shamanism and, and listen about the order of fire, you can instantly see the connection. So it was a great example for me. So I saw doing the order of fire and, uh, you know, watched and read about what you were doing with that. Uh, I got excited about it because I, I feel for a lot of guys like me who had that connection, who had that, that band of brothers and we served in war together and different things. And we've lost that. Uh, the other day I was listening to your, your weekly, your podcast you do. And I, I chimed in hello from so Siberia at the time. Yeah. I thought that was you. Uh, yeah, that was me. But, uh, and that's a whole different, I don't want to get too far off the shamanic things we're talking about, but it has its connection. But why me, why someone with a special operations and HC background is, is going this far, you know, yeah. going into Russia. And I've had this, some serious uh, talks before with security, uh, as I mentioned, very, very professional, but, um, yeah. Uh, I'm still here, obviously, so there's no harm done. But I went this far and stayed this far with my family uh, because it's important to me that I have something to pass down to them. Um, if I myself have reached an end of, of what I believe in your traditional religions and I'm still searching, uh, I've, got, I've got children. I've got small children. And they're looking up to me for guidance. How do we do something this week? Or what do we, what do we believe in? And the questions start coming. What about God and these type of things? Right. And so uh, I look back, I searched far back through many of the Avramic religions and on and on and on. Um, and I found these connections. Mm -hmm. And one of those biggest ones were fire. It was water. It was speech. It was a creation story. It was a, it was a ending story. It was uh, filled with main characters, whether they're uh, prophets or sages or they were gods or whatever you want to label them as. Mm -hmm. And they all had a very similar story that connected. And so when you're looking at those, those are passed down from person to person to person. Uh, sometimes the scriptures can be very, very old, but they're still written by somebody. And I developed a, a distrust for a lot of the dogmatic type writings that I had seen by man. And so I needed something, I needed to go back to a universal truth. And then I'll see what happens and work my way back forward. And I thought several times I'd reached that point through certain religions that I was in. And I went deep into some writings and just, you know, you're talking, you know, and then I'd find something that just didn't click with me or didn't make sense. And so I go again. And so that's when uh, animism and shamanism, uh, you can't go wrong there. There's nobody writing there's no writings. There's no there's no book. There is these days. You can buy books on obviously shamanism, people's experiments and experiences and things like that. Yeah. But it's for the person sitting at home and says, you know, I just don't I just don't agree with some of this stuff or some of this uh, right. typical type religions. Then you can go. You don't have to go all the way to Siberia like I have. Um, you can and you can buy books by people who've done that or been to Mongolia and things of this nature. Um, and I started off that way as well. I read some books on shamanism. Actually, I got, I got a library full of books on multiple religions, but shamanism and animism really isn't a religion. Mm -hmm. uh, it was what people did before they had religion. Right. And so uh, they knew that certain times of the year brought this, that, or the other, that storms mm -hmm. brought this, and that uh, winter, uh, certain things went to sleep, and then in spring, they woke back up. Mm -hmm. And it's also geographical. When we talked briefly uh, a few weeks ago, I believe that there's a geographical spirituality as well. Mm -hmm. And this is echoed in, in shamanism in that in animism, is the general belief is that everything has a life and has a spirit. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. That's just kind of like broad stroke, uh, you know, old tribal speak. And it used to be used to kind of talk down on animism. That's why I said it's not something that is evolving. It's not an evolving thing. It eventually evolves into um, polytheism and then eventually evolves. And no, it didn't. It's, it's still alive today because it's just simple. You there's there's no you know, you have to worship any deities. Right. Um, you know, the Native Americans called it, uh, you know, the great spirit, grandfather spirit and things of this nature. In Siberia, they may call it uh, Tingre. Or they may call it Sky Father and in Indo-European. Mm -hmm. And they looked up. And if you've ever been to Mongolia or any of those uh, Siberian places, the sky is just forever. And it's just inspiring, if you can imagine being back in that time. And so you couldn't go wrong with those. So I went as far back as I could go without going wrong. I can accept that there's life and everything. And if you, even if you're a Christian today, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you believe that uh, the spirit of God is in everything. So you're, you're, you're talking the same language. You just uh, put it on different things. Um, you know, you can look at some of the characters in the Bible as being sages or some people. Yeah, if I go to Siberia right now, they think some of those guys were, were shamans of those, you know, they, you know, using the word shaman for those areas. Um, shamans in South America, you know, uh, shamans in, you know, all over the world, people are using that title. And all it means technically is somebody who's taken that knowledge and animism and the spirit and uh, those type of things and have tried to apply it to, for some it's a profession, for some it's just a, a calling and it just varies around the world. So it just, uh, it kind of was a way to combine the warrior spirit with the, I would call it poet or the, or the voice uh, because voice and breath are also one of those things that's mixed in with fire and water in these, in these creation stories. And there's a strength in that, you know, the ability to create uh, is not lost. And for someone who wants to start something real, uh, get in touch with your local land, your local power places. I mentioned that uh, there's geographic spirituality in Siberia, uh, you know, on Okan Island, there's shamanic rock and there's special places. Mongolia, you've got the, the mountain where they believe, you know, nobody knows exactly where it's at. Uh, Chinggis Khan was buried. So there's usually some type of event attached to a powerful place in Altai, they have the Luka Mountain. So usually mountains and rivers and things of this nature, depending on where you are, everybody has their own special story. I, I early on re refused to believe that there was only one story for one people. I believe that the whole world had their own story and their own path of spirituality and, and journey to get there. And I think they actually have a term for that now. I found that actually the other day, Omnist or something like something that believes that everybody gets their chance to find their own spiritual path. Um, and when you go to some of these places, you learn that these things mean a higher, like a tree, an ash tree maybe means more in uh, Norse uh, traditions than it does here. One may mean, you know, be the oak tree. And so uh, what does it mean for you where you are? You know, somebody uh, listening to this, um, what traditions do you have to fall back on? And that begins with one, appreciating the world and two, your ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, you need to, uh, they say you should know seven generations of your ancestry back. Mm -hmm. And so this tough thing about some people often dealing with that is everybody wants something cool. You know, everybody wants to be, you know, a few years ago, I think it was Irish. And then, <laughs> had, um, <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's like people doing past life regression where they everyone yeah. was Cleopatra and like uh, Charlemagne. Nobody, yeah, nobody's exactly. just, no, no, nobody was uh, the guy who cleaned out the stalls for the horses. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm Egyptian descent or I'm, mm -hmm. you know, a Viking and all this kind of stuff. Right. And I was there. I'm not talking about like, I don't know. I, I felt that hype too. And I got the ancestor DNA and got the DNA to prove it strong. Norse line and Irish line and stuff like that. So um, that was part of my journey. And I think a lot of people are still stuck on that. Um, and I, I've told, I say this actually quite a bit. I've had quite a few people reach out to me that uh, I'm here and, and just ever since actually COVID, a lot of religious type questions, a lot of spirituality type questions. Yeah. And I tell everybody, and it took me a while to start doing what I was telling people. And that is find out who you are. Um, you can come here like I am here. I am not a shaman. And will they ever fully accept me in Siberia as being a shaman? I don't know. And but it's not my it's not my goal. My goal is to pick up the tools because I see that they work. When I am I am I going way back down the, the time train, I found a people still living pretty close to their indigenous ways. Right. Uh, some of them very much so. There's some nomads out there uh, still living in Gur, still hurting, still moving around the um, but you know, they'll have a cell phone. You know, they, they've compromised, they've compromised a little bit, but for the most part, uh, they still have their ancestry altar set up on the North side of their gear mm -hmm. and they'll still go see the shaman or they are a shaman. Um, that's still their doctor and their, their person that's going to reach out to. And so that's where I wanted to go. Who's still living this life, first of all. Right. And right. why is it to be, you know, uh, respected? And mm -hmm. so you, you need to find out who you are, because if I came here 
and tried to be Bharatian, Mongolian, you know, Siberian, all these interrelated indigenous tribes. I can never be that. I can learn uh, Siberian, Tuvan, Mongolian shaman, which is what I study. Um, and I could get good at it. But will they ever see me as being a shaman? I don't know. Uh, I do get a little respect because of my Native American heritage. Uh, they actually highly respect the Native Americans a lot. Um, and that's because the, you know, the North Pass, they believe that life originated in Siberia and Mongolia and the, uh, the tribes there moved up across North Alaska and came down. That's their theory and they believe it here. And archaeologists found uh, recently, actually before my trip, but by my crew went and looked at that, they found bones and DNA matching the same DNA to Native Americans right, right. there at uh, Lake Bacall where I was at. So it's very interesting. You could go back in it forever. <clears throat> My main point is that don't try to be a Viking if you're not, you know, a Norseman. Don't try to be, uh, you know, a Celtic warrior. Don't try to be any of these things if you're yeah. not. You can play it. If you just want to play and feel good about yourself, right. man, go do it. Right, if right. it makes you feel good. Um, but if you really want to find who you are and what you're capable of and what your great ancestry did, and this is all shamanism. I mean, I'm not, I'm not preaching about just ancestry. Uh, it's it's pivotal in shamanism mm -hmm. that you know your ancestral line because in shamanism, you reach out to those spirits for help. Shamanism and animism uh, both believe that your spirits still help you today. They don't believe that uh, when people die, your spirits are gone and you may see them, you know, pin on your belief system. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere down the road, you will, they'll either come back or whatever your ending story is of your faith. They believe that they stay around, mm -hmm. particularly if some reason for seven generations worth uh, before they move on to something else and uh, they help you. And so if you're interested in shamanism or animism or maybe just resetting yourself, uh, then you have to know your ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, things like ancestry and whatever these other things are, they assist you with finding birth certificates and things of that nature if it's hard for you to find and finding that line, finding that country. And there's nothing wrong with, I was excited too when I saw, you know, I had some Norwegian and some Finnish and I had some Ireland and Scotland and all this kind of stuff. I was, I was also Viking, um, you know, um, it made you feel good, like you belonged with something. Right. And so, uh, but you have to get, dig deeper into that journey. And because it's pivotal, 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 pivotal. Uh, every shaman worth his salt will have, an altar of sort, sorts mm -hmm. set up for his ancestors or a place of a place of honor uh, mm -hmm. for his ancestors. And it'll be a small thing that, you know, they may say some words to every day, once a week, um, special times of the year that have pictures there and things that were handed down to their ancestors. And they appreciate their ancestors always and realize that they're still here helping them. Mm -hmm. And even in some of these places, they have special days just for that to visit ancestors and come around. So, Mm -hmm. uh, I encourage people to find out, and that's the thing you run into is, um, you know, you may think you're a Viking, but your seven generations back may have been all Christians. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, yeah. There's nothing wrong. Yeah. yeah. Nothing wrong with well, that. And, and a lot of people, I always say, it, it, you know, you can only look so far. Most people go back. They, they want to believe that they're Vikings, but most people don't have records past 1700. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, like poor people don't have records past 1700. Like that's not real. Like, yeah. So yeah. no, I'm like, you don't, I know that you said you're Celtic because you're, you're, you know, like your ends because your most recent ancestors were in Ireland or something. Right. Um, right. But like, where were they a hundred, uh, 500 years before that? You actually don't know. <laughs> like w when the things that you're fantasizing about uh, happened, your ancestors might have been somewhere else, you know, like that's, right. uh, you know, I, I try to get that across to people because I think they, they make the jump to the fantasy thing like we were talking about uh, very quickly. Whereas, you know, your most recent ancestors are, you know, really kind of closest to you in, in that sense, you know, and you can't, I, I think people like to fictionalize and fantasize about what their my ancestors might have done beyond a certain point, you know, sure. like, uh, and that, and, that's good, but it, sometimes it can become a a substitute for uh, their own real life accomplishment. Right. You know, like they, they they can they try to ride on the coattails of these imaginary people that they don't really know, <laughs> and then you know, like the, it can become a way to prevent them from taking action and agency in their own lives. 
hundred percent. It's a false setup. You become in essence, a paper tiger is what yeah. I call it. You, you become something that you, you look like a Viking, you look like a tiger, you sound like a tiger, but yeah. man, you're not a tiger, but that's okay. You yeah. don't have to be a tiger because the, the fox is just as cool in its own ways, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, big thing for me and hanging around, I said, growing up and hanging around and having the jobs I've had among the special operations group is man, we always wore masks. You know, we, we, you, you're always something, the toughest and, you were always, you know, I mean, I, I was still working in that Viking high time when everybody was a Viking at work. Um, and so it's just, it's not you though. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've reached a, a high pinnacle of operational capability mm -hmm. and everybody around me had reached that. So everybody around me was Navy SEALs and, you know, Green Berets and, you know, Marine Marsoc and Air Force PJs. You had to have that just to be on the team. And then right. you had to make the team. And so everybody's operating at a, at a high, high level and you were your job but when you quit being the job and you don't have it anymore you can't walk around saying i'm this that or the other but what are you well i'm a former of this that i don't like being former anything so um i said well who is john smith you know now that i'm not all these other things who am i and what do i want to pass on to my like i said my children my friends uh what do i feel passionate about i became very passionate about spirituality and I was uh, semi-passionate about it when I was still working. Um, I was following a, a different faith at that time. And and it got me through because uh, I believed in it. And so I was like, well, now, you know, who, who am I and, and who do I want to be? So when I, like I said, when I went all the way back to, sh to animism and shamanism and then said, who am I? Who are my ancestors? I started doing the search. Well, this is who I am. You know, I've. I had to rely on, you know, digging up uh, birth certificates so far back. Like I said, I discovered records. America is kind of at a, a handicap that way. You're, you're, you truly are descendants, you know, from, you can be from Africa, Asia, because America is such a mixed place now. Right. Europe. Once you get so far, it's just a guess of DNA. You know, do your DNA matches people here, unless um, you have some strong connections. My, my wife is from strong Germanic and she had a grandmother, came over from Germany. So the benefit there. But when I started talking to the people in Europe and then even here in Russia, they're very clear on their ancestry. You know, I'm five, fifth, sixth generation, you know, uh, Russian or I'm fifth, sixth generation, you know, in Austria. And or, you know, I, I lived in Norway for a bit. So, you know, those guys really have that Norwegian Norwegian line. And so it gets uh, easier to trace. But if you can't trace it, and that was my main point about the animals thing and making you a shaman today mm -hmm. is. And, you, and I don't want you to recreate it. The problem with uh, some of the Neo type things is, and it goes to that thing about not worshiping the ashes, but keeping the fire burning, is you're wor worshiping ashes of a time you cannot recreate. You cannot totally recreate uh, Nordic shamanism or any of these shamans. They do it in Siberia. They do it. They recently got in trouble here. They sacrificed a bunch of camels. Uh, so they they take it. I mean, they and they did it unabashedly, you know, so. Some places are taken to that level, but the average person can't do that type of thing. And I wouldn't, I'm not trying to condone you do any kind of animal. I mean, I know a guy. But I know a guy who's trying. Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, there's only so much you can recreate. It's almost like, a, it reminds me of the paleo diet that everybody got into for a while. Uh, and then the reality is like, you can't actually, all the food is actually different. Even the, even the seeds right. of food are different than what, if you're trying to go back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, the food is different. Everything's different. Uh, so yeah. you, you actually can't recreate that environment. You have to, and that's, if you really think about all these ancient heroic ancestors that people want to connect themselves to, uh, they were in their own time. Yeah, uh, yeah, they they were they were in their own time and they they were, they were inhabiting their own time, and they may have had a connection to the past a few generations or so forth. Because if you think about, it, I mean, they didn't have birth certificates either, either. You know, like no. they, they, like you, that's yeah, and, you know, like I mean, after a few generations, you really didn't know. Like you wouldn't, <laughs> they couldn't have known a thousand years back. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, because yeah. who would have told them that? Many of them, most of them, didn't have records. Yeah, at all, no. like writing, uh, you know, and yeah. so in mo most cultures didn't have that until very recently. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, you, you have to inhabit the time that you're in. 
uh, right. be, that's all you can really do. I mean, and that's what everyone did, you know, like they make up their own rules. We were talking a little bit about it uh, yesterday because we're, we're going through uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra in the group, right. and uh, which is one of my favorite books. And we're just talking about it. And we're talking about uh, the sequence where he has to go be, from becoming you know, a camel to a lion to a, uh, um, a child. And, you know, we're just talking about different old traditions and new traditions and so forth. And, and that there's a place of creation that you have to get to. And that's kind of this place of, of the child. Uh, it, but the, the lion is actually smashing the old father's ways to a certain right. extent. Uh, and and it, it made me think of that when you were talking about um, the difference between something that has a book and something that doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, because... When men create systems, they write them all down. You know, eventually they, you know, they write them all down and 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 this we're gonna codify this. This right. is how we're doing things now. That's how men organize things. You know, like the, where they they write it down, this is what we're gonna do. Everybody on the same page, here are the laws, you know, code of Hammurabi, whatever. And uh, they write it all down. And uh inevitably, whatever they come up with is gonna piss you off somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Whatever they whatever that last group of guys came up with. They did it for a reason, but that reason might be over, or we don't know why the reason, you know, but, and so, you know, you don't want to stick to that thing that's static in the past because sometimes that, that had a reason to exist when it existed. Right. And, and, and not everything that always existed has to continue to exist in the exact same way. You have to adapt in the way that I'm sure like, you know, there, there's an OODA loop. Uh, <laughs> of things that happen in the world and like, okay, well, you're, you got new information now, like you have to incorporate that and keep moving. Yeah. So, and that's a hundred percent actually why I'm excited about it. Cause you said these characters of old, uh, they knew who they were yes. and they knew who their purpose was or what their purpose was. Mm -hmm. And they went out and did it and did great things, amazing things. They are pushing forward. They were definitely keeping that fire alive and not worshiping the ashes because they weren't sure who the ashes were anyway. They may have been had some, uh, you know, some ancestors teach them or some master or something teach them. But it's about what can you do today? Yes. And and that's why we can't. We could try. And like you said, maybe you know a guy uh, and I know, I know some people here that do it pretty close. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all can't recreate those moments, but we can create our own. And so uh, shamanism and animism gives you that ability even the teachers that i have and i have a i have a, a couple teachers that i work with uh, very selective on on that I, I take wisdom i sit with several when i get a chance when i go to siberia and i get to meet a new shaman i'll sit with them uh, but i have a couple teachers and they actually give you very little direction because they believe that it's it's you really your really own world in the sense of this is how maybe properly to light a fire. Like they, there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way, uh, maybe to light a fire, as far as most of shamanism is concerned. How you build the thing itself, whether it's facing east and west, means certain things in traditional shamanism. However, um, if you didn't know that, and you just lit a fire, and it was in respect to your ancestors and to whatever spirits show up, and you had intention, and you can't do any of these things without the intention. And so if the attention is honest and you're, you're searching, you're going to get something good from that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they told me uh, first, I didn't get really anything. They're like, I'll oh, just build a fire and do this kind of things and just kind of see how it goes for you. And then they come along and they're like, OK, that's that's a good fire, but let's build it this way. And so we build a fire and we layered it up and it's facing east. Most of your fires face east. Uh, for some reason, there's also that uh, continuity between east facing east for a lot of things, whether it's prayers across mm -hmm. multiple religions or whether it's something comes from the east, a sign comes from the east, and things of this nature. Yes. And so, uh, and it's a ancestral fire facing east and the upper world and the middle world. And we talk a little bit about the the three worlds. And when you face one west, it's a lower world fire. It's for so totally something different. And the offerings are different. It's vodka and tobacco instead of milk and cookies. You know. So, um, so a lot of that kind of stuff they nudge you along. Mm -hmm. But then when I reach out to them, they ask you about the experiences you had. And so uh, I've lit a fire and they follow, you know, new moon 
uh, full moon, you know, summer solstice, winter solstice, these type of things, things that really anybody can do anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's an art, it's a belief system. I don't want to call it religion because it's not a religion. Uh, it's a way of life that allows you to flow and have your own experiences mm -hmm. and you can do it with no instruction because there was no instruction in the beginning. First person that lit a fire and, and wanted to worship something in the sky, they just did it. And this kind of went with how they felt. Can you talk to shamans and get little tips on how to make it more like the, the drums? You can't see them here, but I got my. So, you know, some of the tools is, you know, a drum. This is a traditional uh, shaman drum. And on the back of it, it's all handmade. This is a bear and this is a fox, a couple of animals that mean a little something to me. So uh, some people use drums, some people use the jaw harp, some people use singing, mm -hmm. uh, something to uh, get them more into the moment. And some people call it trance. Um, the traditions out here don't use any drugs. I know that's in South America, the ayahuasca and uh, you know, some places, mushrooms and things of that nature, uh, people have to use, but they don't do that here. They, they consider that a big no-no uh, in Siberia. They believe that if you have the intention and you can let yourself go, you can do it with things like drums and jaw harps and things of that nature. So, um, so what, what do you think the, uh, what do you think that the drums do? Cause I, I've, I, that's a joke that I have when I talk to people about ritual is that like, if, if you don't have drums, the ritual is going to suck. Uh, that they, <laughs> like, I'm all like, can anyone play drums? This is like usually my first uh, question right. because that you, you need that. There's something very special about that. What, what do you think that they, they bring to the table? So the, the technical answer mm -hmm. is that, and I'll tell you my own experience. Cool. The technical answer is the, the rhythm mm -hmm. and the vibration it helps you to, uh, you know, there's something very real about vibrations and energy. So um, the vibrations of the drum, the rhythm, something the way we're wired and the way we built, it just gets you, uh, and I kind of call it a trance state. Mm -hmm. You can get into a trance state. Um, it just, it's a vehicle for that. The shamans view the, view the drum as their horse. It's actually, it's the horse that they're riding. And they ride that into the world. And I mentioned here briefly the, the three worlds, the upper world, the middle world, and the lower world. Mm -hmm. And we live in the middle world. And even part of it, we can't see according to shamanism, like mm -hmm. the spirits and things that move around us. Mm -hmm. And the upper world are the upper deities, uh, the deities of the sky and, and all these higher level deities. And in the lower world is the uh, deities or spirits of death and sometimes sickness and diseases. And But it's not viewed the same as let's say the uh, the christian hell um they're not bad guys in shamanism and, and a lot of the traditions outside of the abrahamic religions uh, hell is a place that most people go in fact mm -hmm. uh to um wait their next life or their next whatever you know it's so much so many different traditions you can't just say for sure other than most of the places outside of Abrahamic religion it's not a bad place mm -hmm. and so uh this drum is the horse, one of the main horses, in fact. And I know people uh, here in Siberia that can do the same with the jaw harp. That's the little, it's called the juice harp or the jaw harp or the, uh, they call it the uh, kumas in mm -hmm. Siberia, the little thing you put in your mouth, it makes it, my wife mm -hmm. uh, does for that. But um, the drum for me works really, really well. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Mongolian shamans, they'll turn the drum to the inside. So instead of having the drum uh, facing this way to me and beating on it, Mm -hmm. I will turn it inside right in here and, you know, right inside my head. Um, and it, it takes you somewhere. And I think some of that's the um, connectivity, connectivity we've had with our, our tribal ancestors. You know, our tribal DNA is wired somehow to really get into a drum. You mix it with fire and it's like magic. You know, yep. if, you, if you, build a, you build a real good fire outside and you get a drum, you get a group of people who are just in the moment and it's a beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, it's a very old thing and, it, and people always want to make it like it's LARPing. I'm like, well, no, it's just a very old thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very old thing, the thing that still works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's very, very, very powerful. Um, and like I said, when you get into shamanism in particular, you become very peculiar about your, your tools. So mm -hmm. a lot of the shamans here, either you have to make it yourself. So as a shaman, you got to get pretty crafty. I'm not crafty. I'm, you know, you can look at my background and see that I didn't take sewing and 
and a lot of woodworking, you know, uh, growing up. Uh, so you can also buy it from a reputable shaman. Okay. And that's the thing as well as when you get into it, people are selling shamanistic things around the world mm -hmm. and they're junk. Yeah. And so if you're relying on this item to be, man, this is made for a shaman. I got it off of, you know, Amazon, whatever. No, it's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say it's not. If you want that kind of stuff, I, I hope anybody get it if they can, but you can get some real sources for it. So things like the drum and this thing behind me that looks like a dress is actually called the ton. Uh -huh. And it's a ceremonial garment for shamans. Right. Yeah. As a, this is called your crown. These are feathers and headpiece on it. It's okay. it all serves a, a very unique person purpose. Do you have to have it for your average practitioner? No. If you are studying shamanism and you're thinking you may do some, a lot of the shamans that I know do lower world recoveries of things from like if people lose a piece of their soul or you know through something, a shaman may go to the lower world to recover that piece of soul. Sometimes it's sickness or depression. Uh, I know people who have treated people. I, I, there was a, there's a shaman here who's who's left the art, but his uh, following still leads on. I talked to him. I've talked to him two or three times now. Has treated everything from cancer to uh, AIDS to uh, you name it. So, and they believe a lot of these things come from the lower world, and the shaman will put that on because lower world travel is pretty dangerous, and they wear the head crown and they take all these amulets and things and they'll journey to the lower world. They'll pick up that drum, go into a trance and go into the lower world to recover somebody's soul and this, that, the other. So um, I haven't done that. Um, that's a next level kind of serious, you know, type level. I have the tools to do it, but uh, for me, I'm still finding me, you know, I think with uh, the pieces that I want to use and implement and, uh, the things, you know, the things that are easy, the fire, mm -hmm. uh, the things we see around me, the drums, the ceremonies, uh, they're, they're all very special. Mm -hmm. And I've done some drumming around some people who uh, I don't say anything. I don't prep it. And just they didn't know what was going on. They say they felt something. Some here singing inside the drumming and things of that nature. So I've had my own unique experiences and the things I've done. But I've been privy to uh, amazing things. I mean, just like you think you're watching some kind of magic show and somebody's moving their hand by a fire and I'm watching the fire literally bend around their hand and, and come back out, just otherworldly cool stuff. Uh, and that's really that respect for the fire. That's why I, I asked you about the order of fire. Mm -hmm. The fire in shamanism, you have to have it. Um, indoor, you can, you can do an indoor similar version of it with a candle, mm -hmm. but nothing beats an outdoor fire. And so something about that fire uh, really brings it out. It's considered, it has several names. When I first got into shamanism, I started trying to learn all the names mm -hmm. and then I got lost, you know, because, uh, you know, to the Scythians and Mongolians, you know, it could be uh, Tabiti and then you go to another area of Siberia and they call it Utene. And so when you're trying to address the fire and you got all these names in your head, it's like calling somebody by the wrong name. It's just probably not the best thing. And so I had a wise shaman say, you know, uh, once again, as we talked about, I'll never be Bharatian or Mongolian. Right. Uh, they're like, use your mother tongue. Don't use somebody else's tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, use the tongue that your people had. What would you call it? You know, I'm like, well, all I know about his mother of fire. And if I went and searched Celtic and I could probably come up with some deities or Norse, somebody related to fire. But uh, once I just started using spirit of fire, mother of fire, mm -hmm. uh, things improved for me drastically yeah and so um lighting that fire and beating the drum uh is something that, you know anybody can do yeah yeah we all we all and this is just something i started doing but uh we started uh calling our fire agni uh mm. and, and we just you know call all the all the fires are agni they're all they're all the same fire basically is what uh what part of our lore is at this point now we've been doing it for a while uh and uh, the you know the rationale for that being not that we're trying to be Vedic because uh, we we could be mistaken for a neo Vedic cult but we're really not uh, but but because of the Proto Indo European connection of that and the difference yeah. between sacred fire and profane fire and like uh, basically that you know in the Indo Indo European 
saying there's a separation between profane fire and sacred fire. And our word for fire comes from the profane word of fire. Uh, but nobody knows that. Like I said, so it's, it doesn't, it, this is like all technical shit. It doesn't matter because what words are powerful to you as you right. would, would agree. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, the uh, Agni is, is just comes from Hignuis or whatever that becomes, that, that is also becomes the Latin ignite like an ignitio and then it becomes our word for ignite is, the, is their sacred word for, for the old sacred word for sacred fire. Mm -hmm. And so we, we just use Agni because it's easier than trying to make proto Indo European. And we don't really, that's a theoretical language anyway, and it's not really real. Uh, so it's just, that's the connecting tissue. And that's why we, why we use Agni for that. But uh, uh, it's just uh, that just figure way I figured out how to do it and make it a separate thing, you know? Right. <laughs> No, I agree with that 100. percent And and the names, using the names, and I have to use Otene when I go and train with one of my mm -hmm. uh, people that teach me because they're like, this is this is tradition, you know, uh, that's who she is. Use my, use that name. And so uh, I respect uh, the names, but I'd also like to find out uh, who that would be for me. You know, when I'm tracing down my ancestry line, who, and I'm still doing that. You know, I'm still actually trying to research. You know, as best I can my ancestry what did they call fire and i i may never find it i may have to use spirit of fire oh, it wouldn't be one what is <laughs> it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be one name because no, be. that's several different no. languages <laughs> so yeah. like there, there is no one answer uh to that's that right. uh, you know i'd have to take the greatest percent of my my, <laughs> right. ancestry, my ancestry dna well it says here you know 40 percent uh norwegian what i call it so yeah. um yeah you may never find that name uh, yeah. And so I think when I simplified it, and it's, as you said, it has to do with speech and has to do with intention. Mm -hmm. So my intention quit sweating, uh, trying to come up with all these names I have no connection to outside of my teaching. And I, and I like, uh, you know, you talked about the, the Vedas and the Indo-European. That's huge talk around here because we're very close to where they say the source of that origin was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you really go back in the sciences or the studies, um, a lot of people originated from this region, according to the scholars, you know, the Indo-Europeans and and rolling through Greece and rolling through Russia and, you know, coming up through um, all of that is very well connected. So one of the interesting things about being here is all that rolled through here, you know, so anything that rolled eventually into Europe and eventually into Western Europe, most scholars agree today come from this area yep. somewhere. You know, not that this is the origin of man. I'm not trying to say that, um, but it's a very, very old one. If you're searching the old ways before they got tinkered around with and man thought he was smarter than the system, um, you can get very old here very quick. And there's probably not many things older than Sanskrit and uh, the Vedas and, and things yeah. of that nature. So that's a good place to go. And it's it's good to, like I said, the ancestral geographic, geographical spirituality. When you give respect to things, uh, when I go out here and give respect to the traditions of Mongolia and Tuva with the shamanism, it makes a difference. You know, you're, you're treading you're treading on uh, very serious grounds, not only for the people here, but in the belief of the spirits. Um, you got to show respect. And I come from a, a different ancestry, but if you come with respect, uh, you're you know you're fine. And if you show that respect, so it, uh, it gets you a long way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you talked about the geographic spirituality uh, a little bit, and one thing that I found uh, frustrating in, in a funny way out here, you know, I'm in Arizona, and uh, at Christmas time, they make all kinds of fake snow and inflatable Christmas trees and all kinds of ridiculous things <laughs> that don't belong here. <laughs> yeah, like they, they, there are not pine. I mean, there are pine trees if you go like an hour north or so. You do get a little bit of that. But that's from another place, and uh, it, it's it, from a way other place. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought it was funny because, just in the sense, because they're celebrating Christmas, which is something that happened in a tropical, you know, like it, it, you know, close to the desert, and uh, you know, surrounded by date palms and olive trees, which are actually all around us. Right. <laughs> but they're replacing it with something Germanic that doesn't, yeah. you know. I don't find it very amusing, but obviously, there's a different feel um to a place like this than to that you know to being in uh you know obviously it was up in yeah, oregon and you have this very wet 
place that uh, feels you know you know feels like it could be in northern europe you know it has mm-hmm. it has that kind of vibe to it. it's a, everything's very green everything's very uh you know like uh, very beautiful in that particular way but this is a different place and it has a different vibe uh right. you know, they, you know they, and it, it, all the plants that you'd care about would be different and they the timing is different i have a garden right now it's february uh, mm-hmm. Like it, it, the timing of everything is totally different, uh, which is it's just blown my mind. Like uh, that that uh, it, this is when flowers grow, not 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 uh, they're dead in the summer when it's it's 115 degrees. It's, right. it's now that like you know, there's things growing and 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 so forth, especially in, in a month or so. There's a there's mm-hmm. a very very beautiful spring, but also all through the winter things still grow. It was raining. Right. It's been raining all week, you know. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's a very different. Yeah, every place has its own vibe. Yeah, it's has its own vibe. And depending on how much you want to get connected, how much it's worth to you, right? Or how well you connect to that or not, you know, so you have to have a very strong connection to be connected to some spirituality. Let's just use the, you know, some North something or something and live in a place like Florida, you know, Arizona and place like that where it never gets cold. You, your imagination and yeah. your intention has to be very, very strong. Yeah. Um, Whereas you can, you know, like you say, go up north or like here, snow outside my house is waist deep. I've been shoveling a, a path for months. I haven't seen the ground in months, you know, wow. so uh, it's extremely cold. And, you know, the, you go out in the forest, I can take a couple steps and I'm in the forest, walking through the forest. And it just, it speaks to you. You know, it's like, I don't have to invent anything. I don't have to imagine anything. It's just like, you just feel harder. You know, you just feel, you feel a little bit more like you're, you know, in it. And when you yeah. go to Siberia right now, the, the lake and the water there is frozen. Lake Macaw, extremely magical place. Mm-hmm. Largest lake, deepest lake in the world. They say it's the oldest lake in the world. Um, you go there, it's frozen over and you can walk out on it. You can drive on it. They got cars going across it and you can walk on all this other stuff. And you'll come to a, a rock or a place of power. And there'll be a fire burn on top of it and a shaman, you know, dancing around it. And, and you're just like, I am in another world. You know, the it's it reminded me actually when I was on the island, it reminded me a lot of Norway as well with the uh, has some mountains and there'll just be layers of sky, a different color and the mountains moving and, you know, clouds are moving around it. And you see the water and it's half froze. It's just uh, you have to seek out these places if you just really, really want to connect. If you're lucky enough to have, like you said, a garden, something oh. you can go out to. Uh, yeah. But for some people, you have to go further away. And I'm a big proponent of. Uh, they call it Spirit Quest in uh, America. They call it, uh, I think, Utaseta in Norse tradition. Uh, here, they just uh, they just call it uh, wilding, reconnecting or something. But uh, I would prescribe it along with if you're fed up with everyday average religions and you're trying to connect with something and work your way back forward to find what fits you, the animism, the shamanism, but separating yourself. Um, they say, I think in things like Utaseta, it's, you know, 24 hours or overnight. I believe you need a good three days. And here it's a proponent. I'm, I'm trying to work with a group here. There's some serious people who want to study shamanism mm-hmm. and, and I get that and I support it. There are people who look like me and, and, you know, and they may never be shamans, but it's a tool, uh, to get you there, to get you to be able to do your own thing. And so, I support that. And one of the things that I'm kind of putting forward to that is there are a lot of people who think they're serious about it, but they're not. They, they want to get the online course. They want to get a couple cool attributes and some amulets and and be a shaman, but they don't want to like suffer for it. So uh, I'm prescribing a a three day uh, kind of vision quest, Buddhist type thing here, but in shaman, uh, Siberian form. And you, you go out into the forest and this is something you can do wherever you are. You can definitely do it in, America. I used to live in Colorado and did it when I lived in Colorado. A friend of mine used to do vision quest there up in the mountains of Colorado. And we would go out just a few basics. You know, you don't want to be one of these people that goes out and dies, you know, because you do, you were stupid about it, you know, in the middle of the desert or something. But, you know, the, the things to keep you safe, a little bit of water, a little bit of food if you want to, or you can fast. Anybody can fast for three days if they really put their mind to it. Um, but go out and sit and uh, depending on what tradition, there's several ways you can do it, you know, of how you want to try to connect and what you're trying to connect to, first of all, is yourself. You know, you're sitting out and it gets dark and you light a fire 
and it's cool maybe the first night and the second day maybe it starts to wear on you and then it's, you know the the time goes on and i've heard amazing stories i've experienced amazing things myself in these connection times and a lot of times you just come back knowing a lot more about yourself sometimes you feel you connected to something bigger than you mm-hmm. but um, if you apply it with the intention i used to do it without the intention i used to do it and just think some great crow you know and white elk you know eagle you know all this Native American stuff would just come to me and it never did. I just found out more about myself. But then I learned that if you go out with the intention of I'm here, I am left my ego back at the house and I'm going to build a fire and I'm just going to sit out here and I'm going to think about my life and I'm going to think about the beauty of nature and I'm going to think about doing something positive for my family and for my brothers and things of this nature. And I just won't help, you know, whatever spirits, ancestral or whatever, um, come. You know, and that humility and uh, sometimes the offering, you know, a fire, building a fire and giving respect to fire. And in shamanism, you feed the fire sometimes with things like ghee and and, and different things of this nature. Um, if you show respect in this world still today, in these days, it'll show respect back to you and mm-hmm. you'll get something back and you'll make it'll make you a quick believer. I think anybody who goes out with serious intention for three days puts aside any kind of uh, latent belief or faith that you carry with you from something previous. Mm -hmm. uh, Or if you have no desire to give up what you currently believe, but you just want to reconnect more with yourself and nature, then take that, you know. Uh, So go out there and connect. It won't be bad for you. Mm -hmm. It'll only be good for you. You only come back a better person. And I think that's one of the biggest tools, one of the biggest changes, I think, for me is realizing that you have to disconnect in a lot of ways from civilization Mm -hmm. in the sense of we need civilization. You know, we're using it right now. We're communicating and maybe communicating with somebody sitting far away Mm -hmm. because of technology. But there's no reason why you can't connect to your tribal self, your ancient, ancient ancestor who knew who he was, Mm -hmm. who knew his purpose, him or her. And was comfortable in that skin. You can still be that person today. It's mm-hmm. still out there. But you're going to have to, you know, leave the computer and leave the comforts and the warmth and the full belly and things like that behind. you got to give a little something. And you go out there and you give that up. Uh, it's going to reward you. I guarantee 100 percent. I, I stand on that. If you, if you do it with the intention, don't just go out there and goof off. Um, you'll come back and, and say thank you to Jack for that, that tip that I heard on his, uh, on his podcast. So um, these are the type of things that anybody can do. When I said, you know, here at the beginning, I can make you a shaman in this one podcast. I mean, a hundred percent. I can, I can tell you that you have the power. If you live in an apartment and you have no nature around you then get in a car, take the bus, go to the outskirts of town with your backpack, find some nature, spend some time in it, get to know yourself and uh, respect your ancestors and, Respect that nature is more powerful than you and that it's beautiful and wonderful and it'll answer you back, guaranteed, 100%. And that's without even getting into the the deities and things like that. That's like another level of shamanism that, you know, on the basic level, before man put a name to a god, mm-hmm. all he knew was the earth and his crops and the fire and the thunder and all these these things. And that was enough. Eventually, a name came up somewhere, a connection. And I think a lot of these people uh, became heroes of renown, you know, renown or whatever you say it. So a lot of these people maybe were sages, maybe were shamans, and they connected to something. Mm -hmm. And they got some wisdom and some growth. And they rose up and became heroes. And they went out and did brave things, either physically or uh, mentally or spiritually, and became these characters that we read about now. Uh, some of them even elevated to godlike status. You know, they, uh, I, I've obviously been down this rabbit trail for many, many, many years. I know you have as well. Um, you know, some of the biggest names in mythology started as kings and warriors and heroes. Uh, and they traveled through lands such as this one and all the way into Europe and then uh, somehow attracted a following. Next, you know, they're a deity of a pantheon. pantheon. Mm-hmm. And so, um, Am I telling everybody that uh, you can be a God too? Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying that, let's just say that they sacrificed a lot often to get there. 
Mm-hmm. And obviously a story grows and grows and grows as you tell it many times, and especially if it's a good story. But at the beginning of the day, there was somebody who made uh, some noise. You know, they, they drew some people's attention. They earned a name uh, that was remembered. And whether that's remembered as a, as a hero or uh, a godlike figure or who knows what, uh, a lot of those names are still used today. And so I think that's within all of our reach if you want it bad enough. But if you don't want it bad enough to uh, put everything aside and go off in the woods for three days and sit and find yourself or to put aside maybe what you think you know um, or what you've been told you should know and just saying I'm going out with a blank slate mind and see what comes up. you got to like put the ego aside and things it's hard for us to do. Um, you'll never get there. You'll never be Hercules or any of these other characters uh, unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. But it's within everybody's reach. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I feel like if I ask you more questions, we'll do in totally different rabbit holes. And that's such a nice little uh, book <laughs> of, uh, that, that I think I'll probably end it there. Yeah, uh, because that's, that's a, that's a nice uh, uh, finish uh, rather than uh, we could obviously talk about the details of things for forever. And maybe we'll do that yeah, again. Sure. Time. But, uh, but anyway, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, uh, having this talk and telling us about your journey and what you're, doing and finding about it and, uh, and give, maybe giving people some ideas uh, to, to inspire them to go out and do a thing. Uh, you know, yeah. And, let's get out there and do something. Yeah. I mean, uh, as you said, the, the, there's nothing about that could be bad. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. it's going to work out for you positive for sure. Right. For sure. And if you want details on, you know, like I said, we can, we talk again and get in deep details about shamanism and things of that nature, like mm-hmm. the rabbit hole. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anytime. So awesome. Awesome. Maybe we'll do that in the future. But yeah, sure. Well, it's been a pleasure. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you for joining me today. And uh, to everybody who is watching or listening to this, uh, thank you for watching and uh, like and subscribe and all those things that you should do uh, to help uh, so that we can keep doing things like this. So thank you and uh, stay sober. Pater is the cultural arm of the Order of Fire. For more, visit ph2t3r.com.